And after a decade of steroid use, the short list of what you would still want to run gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And Test, Primo, and Anivar is always on the short list of well, the majority of the people that I talk to. Vigorous Steve here. Let's compare Prima Bolin versus Masterone because you wanted to know if you could replace Prima Bolin with Masterone and get comparable effects because pharmaceutical grade Prima Bolin is not available to you. You don't have access to Bayer Prima Bolin Depot or it's simply too expensive. And even the underground lab Prima Bolin that you do have access to is too expensive also. Well, you're a little bit worried that the Prima Bolin is actually Masterone and you're paying that premium Prima Bolin price but you're ending up with Mastrone instead anyway. Or you're worried about sterility. Well, unfortunately, in this case, you don't really have a choice because Mastrone is only available as an underground lab and, well, a little bit more affordable, affordable Prima Bolin is probably only available as an underground lab also. So let's discuss that in this video. Can you replace Prima Bolin with Mastrone and go for a little bit cheaper alternative? and get comparable effects? The short answer is no, um, otherwise I would be running Masterone and I always lean towards Prima Bolin considering that it's available as a pharmaceutical product and well, unfortunately Masterone has been uh, long since pulled off the market so no more pharmaceutical grade Masterone available but there are some overlapping effects which could be beneficial uh, depending on your goals. So let's discuss that in this video starting off with a little bit of a history so you guys have an understanding on how these steroids were used in medical settings. The chemical name for primobolin is methanolone. Methanolone initially got introduced into the medical field in 1962 when it was developed by Squibb. Squibb presented methanolone in two different products, Nebol, which was methanolone acetate tablets, and Nebol Depot, which was methanolone enantate injections. Now, at the time when methanolone, primobolin or nebol, however you want to call it, was still used in medical settings, it was prescribed in the treatments of muscle wasting diseases, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, and to counter prolonged corticoid steroid treatments. After the 1990s, nebol and nebol depot got discontinued in most parts of Europe and in the United States. And at that point, or somewhere around that time, Shearing acquired the license to produce methanolone acetate and enantate from Squibb and produced their own Shearing, Primobolin S, being methanolone acetate tablets, and Primobolin Depot. In 2006, Shearing merged with Bayer, and then Bayer rebranded Primobolin, I believe in 2014 or 2015, into Rimabol. So now we have Rimabolin S, which is available in Japan, and I believe it's only the available there. And I can't really find the details about the Japanese FDA because it's all in uh, kanji or hiragana or however that language is called. And I, unfortunately, I can't read that. So as far as I know, Rima Bolin S, Bayer Rima Bolin S is only available in Japan. And I'm not sure if that's available for the local market or only produced for export only, which sometimes happens where medications are produced in one country, but they're only produced for exportation. Um, unfortunately, I can't find the data, but I know that there's some Rimabolin S available um, in Japan, right? If that falls off the wagon for the local market, again, I'm not really sure. Rimabolin Depot is FDA approved in Spain and Turkey currently for aplastic anemia due to bone marrow failure. And that's the only medical application which is still um, prescribed. Now, I believe that one of the reasons why methanolone was discontinued in the United States and later on most parts of Europe is due to the virilizing side effects, especially in women. So when methanolone was prescribed for anemia or muscle wasting diseases, sarcopenia, for example, some virilizing effects might occur with prolonged use, which is, of course, highly undesired. And some of the treatments that it was initially prescribed for, um, alternative medicine came to market, like erythropoietin, EPO, or uh, Epoetin alpha, uh, Procrete, for example, which are also highly beneficial to treat aplastic anemia due to bone marrow failure, even though a Prima Bolin is still prescribed to treat that uh, specific disease. Now, when it comes to muscle wasting diseases, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, and even to counter prolonged corticoid steroid use, other anabolic steroids or other medications are now desired because they're less virilizing or they have 
less overall side effects. And I also want you to remember that, especially important later on in this video when we do the comparison between primabolin and masterone, is that many of the medical conditions in which case methanolone was prescribed require anabolism to resolve these particular issues. So when there's bone marrow failure resulting in aplastic anemia, primobolin acts as a blood builder, increasing red blood cell count and hematocrit percentage, which is anabolism. I mean, anabolism is nothing more than the synthesis of complex uh, molecules and tissue within a living organisms. So whether anabolism occurs in the bone marrow resulting in more red blood cells, or anabolism occurs in skeletal muscle resulting in either more, se uh, more skeletal muscle cells or the thickening of the skeletal muscle cells, which is hypertrophy, right? It's all anabolism. Now, when primobolin is prescribed in case of sarcopenia or muscle wasting diseases, that's the anabolism that we're used to, right? That's the, the growth or at least uh, maintaining a skeletal muscle when there's a disease present, which would otherwise catabolize uh, the muscle tissue away, right? In sarcopenia, that's due to immobilization or due to age. And while well, there's many different muscle wasting diseases, including HIV, in which cases, right, primobolin was prescribed. So keep in mind that for medical treatment, primobolin is prescribed in cases where anabolism is required. And you can't say the same thing for Mastron, but we'll make a direct comparison a little bit later on in this video. Let's go over the, a little bit of history of masterone. The chemical names for masterone are drostanolone and bromostanolone. So if you want to do some research on masterone, you'll have to use both chemical names as a keyword. So when you go to Google Scholar, PubMed, Science Direct, you search for papers with drostanolone as a keyword. And then later on, you search with bromostanolone as a keyword to get access to all of the papers in case you want to do research for yourself and figure out all of the pharmacodynamics and uh, which medical applications bromostanolone or drosanolone might have, right? In which cases they were rejected. You'll have to use both chemical names as a keyword. Keep that in mind, guys. Drosanolone or bromostanolone was introduced into the medical field in 1962, developed by Syntex in co collaboration with Ellie Lilly. Drosanolone and bromostanolone were presented under many different product names. Drolban, Masterit, Masteril, Masterone, the product we all came to know and love, Mastisol, Metormon, Permastril, and Promethalone, which were all discontinued in the 1980s in the United States and the 1990s in Europe, probably for the same reason due to all the virilization which might occur, because Masterone, Drosanolone, Bromostanolone, the only medical application for this compound was in treatment of estrogen positive breast cancer in women. Being a dihydrotestosterone derivative, many females experienced the virilization or virilizing side effects while they're being treated with uh, drosanolone or bromostanolone. And after selective estrogen receptor modulators, tamoxifen, raloxifene, tormaphene, and aromatized inhibitors, Arimidex, Eximestain, Letrozol came to market in the 80s and 90s. Masterone was no longer a viable option in the treatment of estrogen-positive breast cancer. When we want to calculate and make a direct comparison, get the same amount of molecules comparing primobolin to masterone, we have to factor in the molecular weight, which is different, but also the medical esters, because primobolin is methanolone enantate and masterone is drostanolone propionate. Knowing that, we're going to base this off one mole. One mole is a certain amount of molecules allowing you to extrapolate the molecular weight into the molar mass, which is grams per mo uh, mole. So that means one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the power 23 molecules. 10 with 23 zeros behind it, the amount of molecules, which is 602.2 sextillion molecules, right? I didn't choose this naming convention 602.2 sextillion molecules. So let's base it off that so we can extrapolate the molecular weight into the molar mass and then base a, a dosing protocol on the molar mass, including the ester. So if you want 602.2 sextillion molecules of methanolone, we'd need 302.458 grams of methanolone 
meaning we'd need 414.89 milligrams of methanolone intake to get this one mole, 602.2 sextillion molecules of actual methanolone. And if we do this for masterone, to get 602.2 sextillion molecules of drostanolone, and if we want the exact same amount of drostanolone molecules, one mole, 602.2 sextillion drostanolone molecules, we'd need 360.75 milligrams drostanolone propionate. So that means based on uh, one mole, right, the same amount of molecules, you'd need 414.89 milligrams primobolin versus 360.75 milligrams masteron. That should yield the exact same amount of molecules. Now raise your hand if you would like to run a 414 or 415 milligram prima ballon only cycle. I'd raise two hands, that would be me. I would, I would run that cycle in a heartbeat. Or you would like to run a 661 milligram masteron only cycle. Any takers? 450 milligrams of primobolin only versus 361 milligrams of masteron. Yeah, I think most people would opt for the primobolin only cycle, even though it's way more expensive. Uh, assuming that you can find legitimate Bayer Rimobolin, I think most people would agree that you would get much better results from 450 milligrams primobolin per week versus 361 milligrams masteron per week. Now, why is that? Well, when we look at the clinical data, the medical settings, the medical treatments, again, prima bolin was prescribed in cases where anabolism is required. And masterone was prescribed in cases where anabolism of cancer was not desired. Masterone was prescribed as an anti-proliferation agent or compound. Right? We don't want this cancer to grow and metastasize. We want this cancer to slowly go away. So right, the, the quality of life and the outcome of life is much better than without this compound or using selective estrogen receptor modulators or aromatase inhibitors or invasive surgery. A prima bone only cycle of 415 milligrams per week versus a 361 milligram mastron only cycle, prima bone would win hands down. Now, don't get me wrong, Mastron will still put some muscle tissue on you if you train for hypertrophy and put everything into place to elicit muscle growth. And even though it was not prescribed in treatment of sarcopenia, muscle wasting diseases, and everything else that Prima Bolin was at one point in time prescribed for, when you look at the virilizing side effects that manifested in women when they were prescribed Mastron to treat estrogen-positive breast cancers, we can already determine that there's some anabolism and, and, and virilization occurring, which is, of course, one of the beneficial effects of Mastron when men use that um, to elicit muscle growth. Now, is that as much as primobolin on a milligram for milligram basis? I highly doubt it. Otherwise, Mastron would have been prescribed for sarcopenia as well. So we have a compound that's prescribed as an anabolic agent in particular medical conditions and a compound that's prescribed as an anti-proliferation drug to mitigate or reduce or right, completely halt the growth of breast cancer. One is an anabolic process or anabolic result and one is a catabolic result. And the anabolic results that are coming from mastrone you should consider as a side effect. Actually, it's an unwanted side effect. That's why it was discontinued in these kinds of treatments. Now, when we look at the anabolic to androgenic ratings, we get a little bit of a different story compared to the initial medical treatments that primobolin and Mastron were prescribed for and ultimately got discontinued in. Primobolin has an anabolic rating of 88 and an androgenic rating of 44 to 57, while Mastron has an anabolic rating of 62 to 130, but it's much higher than primobolin, and an androgenic rating of 25 to 40, which is a little bit lower than primobolin. Now, 
where the medical treatments in these anabolic to androgenic ratings differ is that medical treatments are obviously incorporated for humans, right, in particular medical settings. And these anabolic to androgenic ratings are based on the Hersberger bioassays, which were determined in male rats, where they castr castrate the rats and then measure the weight changes in the ventral prostate. And the levator ani muscle is located underneath the prostate. It's part of the pelvic floor where it helps with movement, sexual functioning, defecation, urination. And these Hirschbergers bioassays, they wanted to determine how steroids would affect the male reproductive system of rats, right? and then extrapolate that into an anabolic to androgenic rating. So the anabolic rating was based on the growth of the levator ani muscle, and the androgenic rating was based on the growth of the ventral prostate. And it's a little bit hard to extrapolate that into results on skeletal muscle, right, using the anabolic rating, because in the Hirschberger's bioassay, these rats were not given a hypertrophy response or um, some sort of activity to elicit muscle growth. So even though the anabolic rating of primobolin is lower, right, that the mean is lower than masterone, again, that's based on the levator ani muscle, not on skeletal muscle. So take the anabolic to androgenic rating with a grain of salt. In the future, I'll do a separate video about it on how these Hirschberger's bioassays were performed and if the anabolic to androgenic rating of testosterone is even valid, because, well, testosterone aromatizes into estradiol and dihydrotestosterone, which are both anabolic and androgenic by themselves as well. So is it anabolic to androgenic rating based on testosterone alone or testosterone in combination with estradiol and dihydrotestosterone? I'll make a separate video about that in the future. So take it with a grain of salt from personal experience and everything that I've seen uh, of people using primobolin, I would say that primobolin on a milligram for milligram basis compared to masterone is more anabolic and less androgenic. Even when you use um, a dose with the same amount of actual molecules, right, which we calculated a little bit earlier. So that's, let's say you compare 415 milligrams of primobolin to 361 milligrams of masterone, which both yield the same amount of molecules. I would say that the primobolin is more anabolic and less androgenic, right? Just based on the anecdotal evidence that I've seen and taking into consideration that primobolin is medically used as an anabolic agent and mastrone was medically used as, a, as an anti-proliferation drug. Now, unfortunately, the relative binding affinity of primobolin and mastrone to the androgen receptor compared to testosterone or the estrogen alpha and beta receptor compared to estradiol or the progesterone receptor compared to progesterone or the glucocorticoid or the mineral corticoid receptors are unknown. And the relative binding affinity to the aromatized enzymes or the 5-alpha reductase enzymes are also unknown. So I'm not really sure if that hasn't been studied when methanolone was developed or when drostanolone, bromostanolone was developed. But as of now, these relative binding affinities to the receptors or other uh, proteins in the bloodstream that aromatize, that aromatize testosterone and estradiol or dihydrotestosterone is unknown. What I do know is that both primobolin and masterone act as a reversely binding aromatized inhibitor. So primobolin would enter the aromatized enzyme and prevent testosterone from converting into estradiol. And masterone does the same thing. Now, how much of a difference there would be is very, very hard to say because the relative binding affinity has not been examined or is not publicly known. And based on blood work, it's, it's honestly, it's very hard to say because I've seen, right, there's so many factors that lead into aromatization, high or low body fat levels, nicotine, zinc, methane, right, all these things would result in a lower serum estradiol concentration, whether you use primobolin or mastron or a combination or none of the above, right? All of that contributes into how high or how low your serum estradiol concentrations are going to be. So it's, for me, it would be very hard to pinpoint if primobolin has a higher effect on reducing serum estradiol concentrations or mastron does so. But the additional benefit of mastron in this scenario regarding serum estradiol concentrations is that, well, mastron was medically used 
to inhibit some of the effects of estradiol well, regarding uh, uh, estrogen positive breast cancer, that is. But at least it was shown that masterone can inhibit or mitigate some of the estrogen mediated gene transcription. So even though both might act as a reversely binding aromatized inhibitor, masterone has that added benefit, and perhaps primabolin has the same, but I haven't been able to find a study confirming or denying the fact that at least masterone inhibits estrogen-mediated gene transcription. So even though the estrogen, uh, the estradiol attaches to the estrogen alpha or beta receptor, and then in an attempt to transcribe DNA, masterone is there to prevent that from happening. Both are a little bit different in the sense, even though they both reduce serum estradiol concentrations, um, assuming you're running a testosterone base, I would say that mastrone has a more pronounced effect regarding everything that has to do with estradiol over primabolin, which is the main reason why 9 out of 10 bodybuilders would use mastrone only during a contest prep or a cutting phase, is because at that duration of time, some anti-estrogenic effects, whether that's an anti-aromatize effect or a, a direct anti-estrogenic effect where it inhibits estrogen-mediated gene transcription, this effect of mastrone that's almost exclusive to mastrone, or at least to the extent that mastrone produces, this effect is highly beneficial during a cutting phase when you don't want so much estrogen-mediated collagen synthesis to, right, to have a thicker skin or um, estrogen-mediated fat storage. When you're trying to get as lean as possible, so you don't want any of this estrogen burden regarding fat storage, in, in which case mastrone might be more beneficial than primabolin. But when you look at the anabolism, primabolin is more beneficial because, again, if it doesn't inhibit estrogen-mediated gene transcription, which also results in anabolism, collagen synthesis, favorable lipid levels, and, uh, and all the good stuff that's associated with estradiol, if primabolin doesn't do that and still keeps estradiol within favorable parameters, assuming that testosterone is dosed in a one-to-one -one ratio to primabolin, then the overall anabolism that you would get from primabolin is certainly a lot higher compared to mastro, which again is an anti-proliferation compound. So if you're going to consider mastrone instead of primabolin and still want the anabolism, you would probably need to dose your testosterone a little bit higher compared to before. So let's say you run or you wanted to run testosterone and primo in a one-to-one -one ratio and get an overall anabolic effect while keeping your estradiol within favorable ranges, right? You're resulting in good lipid levels and neuroprotection and everything else that's positively associated with estradiol. Let's say that's 300 test and 300 primo, an arbitrary number. Let's say you don't have access to primo and you would like to use mastrone instead. Personally, I would raise the testosterone from 300 to 400 and just use 200 milligrams of mastrone, a lower dose than the dose of primabolin, and simply look at mastrone as an anti-estrogenic compound, not as a compound that's going to put muscle tissue on you, that's going to be a side effect of using it, but not as your as an additional compound that is going to build sufficient amounts of muscle tissue. I would look at it as a method to control estrogenic side effects this higher dose of testosterone is now going to potentiate. But you'll still need to increase your testosterone dose a little bit higher than you intended because you need to get the anabolism that mastrone is not going to fulfill as much as a primabolin will when comparing the same amount of um, molecules, right? So that's how I would look at it. Let's say you can't get primabolin or it's too expensive or right, for whatever reason, and you will have to go with mastrone instead, whether that's propionate or enanthate or phenylpropionate, which I've never used and have no uh, intention of ever experimenting with, I would dose your testosterone a little bit higher to make sure you still get an anabolic response because you're probably not going to get so much, so much of an anabolic response from the mastrone in a one-to-one -one ratio with testosterone. So maybe you can run it in a two-to-one ratio which from what I've seen on all the blood work, myself, clients, people that I've talked to over the year, a two to one ratio with mastrone in most cases is sufficient to keep estrogen very comparable 
to where it is on a one-to-one -one ratio of testosterone to prima bowl. And I know that's a little bit bro science, but right, it hasn't been examined. A direct comparison of testosterone plus primo to testosterone plus masterone, it hasn't been examined in medical settings. And it probably never will because both compounds are pretty much discontinued as of now. So we're going to have to do a little bit of self-experimentation. Take it from me. Primobol is more anabolic. You would need to run a lower dose of testosterone if your overall uh, anabolic intake is capped at, let's say, 600 milligrams per week. Of course, this means that that cycle is going to be significantly more expensive right? because you're running more Primobol and, and Primobol is certainly a lot more pricey. Whereas Masterone, to get the same amount of muscle mass as this cycle of 300 test and 300 primo, let's say you want the same amount of muscle mass, but save a significant amount of money in the process, you would need to run more tests because that is where you're going to get most of the anabolism from. And you're simply using mastrone as an uh, aromatized inhibitor or as an anti-estrogenic compound to mitigate some of the side effects that a higher dose of testosterone is going to elicit. So keep that in mind. Can you combine both? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I've designed this protocol many, many years ago for the people or for the clients that wanted to run Primo and actually wanted to run a gram of Primo per week, but simply couldn't afford it. Or there was limited supply and they had to stretch out all this Bayer Primobolin or Remobolin to a longer period of time. So instead of running a thousand milligrams of Bayer Primo per week for 10 weeks in duration, they would run maybe 500 milligrams for 20 weeks in duration and add 200 milligrams of mastrone on top. Now, would they build the same amount of muscle tissue? No, right? unless they raise the testosterone concentration to kind of compensate for the lack of anabolism that they would otherwise get from primobol. So let's say instead of 1,000 milligrams of test and 1,000 milligrams of primobolin, they would run maybe 1,250 milligrams of testosterone 500 milligrams of Primo and 200 milligrams of Mastrone on top. And even though the overall intake of anabolics is pretty much the same, right? A thousand milligrams of testosterone inotate plus a thousand milligrams of methanolone inotate versus 1250 milligrams testosterone inotate, 500 milligrams uh, methanolone inotate and 200 milligrams trostanolone inotate, for example, your overall anabolic intake is pretty much the same, discounting for the ester weight. The results were regarding muscle mass and the cosmetic look and appeal will also be pretty much the same, but one cycle is pretty much twice the price as the other ones because the, the prima ballon dose is so much lower, even though the results in the cosmetic look are almost identical, assuming that the diet and the training and all that good stuff is carefully manipulated. So if you're initially set up for a protocol involving testosterone and primobolin in a one-to-one -one ratio, but you can't find primobolin or it's simply too expensive, and you would like to incorporate mastrone instead, you would have to increase the dose of testosterone or add in another compound that's considerably cheaper than primobolin, like boldenone, for example. I mean, it has some overlapping effects regarding the inhibition of the aromatized enzymes temporarily as well, just like Primo and Masteron do. So you might be able to get away with a combination of testosterone, boldenone, and Masteron, save a little bit of money in the process, and elicit very similar cosmetic results, as well as um, the increase in red blood cell count, which is what boldenone is also known for, just like Primo Bolin, and the Masteron, and the combination of boldenone converting into dihydroboldenone, would yield a decent amount of anti-estrogenic effects, whether that's the inhibition of uh, estrogen-mediated gene transcription or the temporary inhibition of the aromatized enzymes, uh, preventing the conversion of testosterone into estradiol. That would be considerably cheaper. Uh, from a cosmetic perspective, would look almost the same, right? combining uh, test, boldenone, and mastrone. But, 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 boldenone comes with its own side effects. So this is a little bit of an issue. You have to pick your poison accordingly. What can you tolerate? How does your blood work change? Um, and again, if you have to do blood work more frequently because you went with testosterone, boldenone, and mastrone, now having three compounds to consider the variables of regarding 
how they change your blood work. Uh, maybe overall you'll be spending a lot more money than you initially thought you would. So keep all of that in mind, guys. I know it's a little bit complicated. Uh, still, if there was a better way than running testosterone and prima ball in the one-to-one -one ratio, I would be doing it. <laughs> and I would be recommending something different. I've experimented with so many different protocols in the past, and I've talked with so many different people's um Right, regarding uh, unique combinations of test, primo, boldron, mastron, trend, ment, etc., etc., etc. And after a decade of steroid use, the short list of what you would still want to run gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And test, primo, and anivar is always on the short list of well, the majority of the people that I talk to. And even though mastron has its place, especially during a contest prep, um, it, it usually doesn't find its way into the shortlist of most guys. Let's say if you were to choose three anabolics, <laughs> most people would choose either test trend or anivar or test primo and anivar, right? That trend would probably be the fourth compound and then maybe the fifth compound. Well, nowadays, most people would choose nandrolone over masterone because again, you can get better results with primobolin than masterone on a milligram for milligram basis and also on a molecule for molecule basis. I'll leave it at that, guys. I hope this helps you uh, regarding your own decision making process. Again, Masteron is not a bad compound. If you don't have access to Primo, it's still a suitable addition. Um, you would just need to raise the anabolics that you're running because Masteron is not very anabolic by itself. Again, would you run 361 milligrams of Masteron, Drosanol propionate, by itself? If you're willing to do it, send me your blood work before and after. I would love to see it. I would consider a primobolin only cycle, 415 milligrams of primobolin per week. I would run that cycle, but not in a million years would I run 361 milligrams of mastron by itself. I'll leave it at that. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find the ebooks on my website, vigorsteve.com slash shop. Personalized advice always available through consultations. You can find the rates on my websites as well. Vigorous crew, you guys know what to do. Test and Primo, front double bicep for you guys. Almost in a one-to-one -one ratio. A little bit more tests than Primo. But hey, that's uh, due to the ampules being a little bit differently dosed. I'll leave it at that, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. See you in the next video.